Welcome to the Matt Lupu Podcast. I'm your host, Matt Lupu. I'm going to make a controversial statement. The study of the ancient world is vital to American society and life. Now, in previous eras of American history, this statement would not have been controversial in the least. If I had been alive at any point between, say, the American Revolution and World War II, nearly everyone would agree with me. Now, it appears that things have changed, and that's a shame. So, let me explain. What is the classics? If we cast as wide a net as possible, the classics, as an academic discipline, is the study of the Greco-Roman world. If you want to know about Greece in the Bronze Age, then you need the classics. If you want the Roman Empire, classics. If you want to know about Egypt from the building of the pyramids to Alexander the Great to the foundations of the Coptic Church, you guessed it, classics. The field is quite broad and quite deep. I like to think about it not as a topic in and of itself, but more like a massive container where you can fit just about any subject. Some of those subjects include literature, history, archaeology, art and art history, rhetoric, philosophy, really anything that you want to know the deep history of, or the first recorded incident of, can fall under the broad heading of, quote-unquote, the classics. Now, the million-dollar question, why study it? I, like many teachers, like to give advice to students. Whenever I stand up in front of a class, I usually make a pitch to them as to why you should change your major to the classics. Most people, when they hear that, have an instantaneously negative reaction. Can you imagine any parent of a college-age student encouraging their kid to get a classics degree? Can you imagine anyone talking about a humanities degree in any way other than derogatory? A bachelor's in classics is the prototypical humanities degree. In fact, it was the original university degree going back to medieval times when all the classes would have been taught in Latin. If most people don't want their kid to, quote, waste their time on any humanities degree at all, degrees like art history, religious studies, philosophy, etc., then certainly a classics degree must be included in this waste of time camp. I don't think it's wrong to characterize these degrees as a punchline to a bad joke. Think underwater basket weaving. My question is, why and how did that happen? How did we go from ubiquity to this? The answer to those questions comes down to money. I think most people, not all mind you, but most, view college as a money-making proposition. You can easily go onto the internet and pull up all sorts of charts that describe college degrees in specifically these terms. The calculation is made like this. One must spend X dollars on a degree, which will then qualify the student to recoup that cost by giving them access to a higher paying job. The quicker one can recoup the cost, the more valuable the degree is. This is known as return on investment, or ROI. The trouble is that there are some degrees out there that have a negative ROI. If I spend $100,000 on a religious studies degree from Harvard, but then I go on to work as a greeter at Walmart, well then, perhaps, one could argue that the degree was not worth the trouble. It's hard for me to argue that the classics, or any other humanities degree for that matter, is definitely worth pursuing for every student that walks onto a college campus. Not everyone starts with the same financial resources. Not everyone is interested in the same topics. It would be just as short-sighted and incorrect for me to argue that a classics degree is for everyone as it would be to argue that a STEM degree is for everyone. 
The problem, as I see it, is that there are many people out there making exactly that argument. Humanities is a waste of time because of the ROI calculation, but STEM is not because of the ROI calculation. Therefore, everyone should do STEM. There are many other problems with this line of argument, in addition to the problem of interest. And perhaps the biggest problem is one of philosophy. Just what exactly is the point of education in the first place? If the point of education at the university level is to make money, or, if I reword that slightly, if all education is job training, then I suppose the discussion of ROI and dollars and cents is the correct way to look at a degree. However, I don't think that all education is in fact job training. If that were true, wouldn't we be encouraging people to go to trade school in equal proportion to those we encourage to pursue a four-year degree? Do most people think that a master plumber making $200,000 a year has an equal educational attainment to a pediatrician making $200,000 a year? Do they have the same weight socially? Or does one job command more respect, whatever that means, than the other? No, clearly there still exists some magic in the white collar that is valued over the blue one, even if the blue collar worker is making more money than their white collar counterpart. Well now, if you agree that education is not the same thing as job training, then it follows that we should probably not be treating every four-year degree like its sole purpose is to lift students into the middle class. This is not to say that high earning potential can't or shouldn't be a goal when sending kids to college, but it can't be the only one. Allow me another thought experiment. Let's pretend that computer science becomes the degree with the highest earning potential of them all. In some theoretical world yet to come, the average salary of a computer science major is $60,000 per year with the highest income earners making over $100,000 in their first year on the job. Now let's imagine that all of these computer science majors all get jobs working in AI development, and since every single one of them ignored everything in their university's curriculum other than computer science, none of the workers in the very many companies working on AI development, all the way from the CEOs down to the most junior programmers, can imagine how an unscrupulous government might use their technology. Nor do any of them pay a single thought to the idea of their AI becoming sentient. In their eyes, the AI should simply be turned off if it gets too smart. Or maybe the new life form that they're creating should be permanently enslaved to human beings. Or what if instead of AI research, our software engineers will all work at Facebook? What could possibly go wrong with linking the entire world together in a series of social networks that are impossible to govern? Who could have possibly foreseen such a problem? Now let's pretend that you're a college freshman. You have a free ride to college via scholarships, and your parents are not pressuring you into a computer science degree. If you agree that education is not the same thing as job training, and you're not in dire financial straits, then why should you pick classics? Well, first of all, it's a lot of fun. If you're the sort of nerd that likes to learn every detail about your favorite fandom, like Lord of the Rings, for example, then the classics is for you. For a certain type of person, very much joy can be found in learning minute details about elvish armor and the deep mythical past of Middle-earth. In fact, the only thing that could make that joy more vivid and more intense would be if our Lord of the Rings fan woke up and found themselves somehow transported to the Shire and began a fresh new adventure with Bilbo Baggins. If this sounds like the plot to a fantasy novel, it's because what I'm describing is a well-worn trope. Everyone at some point in their life, dreams of escaping into another world where they can have adventures. The difference between Lord of the Rings and the classics, at least on one level, is that you can dig anywhere you want on planet Earth for as long as you like and never find an example of elvish metalworking. 
the same cannot be said about the Romans. Put another way, the classics allow students to escape into the real past of the real world, but the adventures that they're reading about really happened, and the details that they're soaking up will be rewarded with good grades in school. If someone offered me the option to major in Star Wars when I was 18, I would have jumped at the chance. I would have written term papers about the problems in the Jedi religion and the different types of lightsabers that the Jedi create. That is what the classics is. It's a space where you can pick whatever you like about the ancient world, learn as much as you can, have fun doing it, and be rewarded for it. But it doesn't stop there. The very same call to adventure that I described above exists in the classics. But unlike the example of Lord of the Rings, it's quite real. For the adventurous type, it's possible this very second to fly to Cambridge and pour through the oldest holdings of their library. That's because their library is so old and so vast that they're not quite sure what exactly they have in there. Or perhaps you'd like to go to St. Catherine's Monastery in the Sinai Peninsula in Egypt. There's an ongoing project to digitize the library there, photographing the oldest books, some of which date back to the 6th century, under a variety of light sources to see if modern researchers can discern whether or not some of the pages were previously written on and then recycled later. These are just a few examples of the real-life adventures waiting out there for the right student. In fact, there are all sorts of people out there working on projects related to the classics that would love to have some help. Offering that opportunity to travel to an exotic location, to work with an international team to pursue a common goal, is the stuff of movies and novels. But how many college freshmen know that it is in fact real? Well, that's all well and good, but what am I supposed to do with this degree once I'm done with school? our imaginary college freshman might ask me. If you still agree with me that education is not job training, then the answer is quite a bit. I would argue that those other majors, the ones that are attractive because they lead to high-paying jobs, cannot and do not teach vital skills to students. I teach at a large state university. I am in close contact with the results of my state's public schooling my students walk onto campus utterly ignorant of information that I would consider essential for a college student. For example, most of my Latin students begin Latin class totally ignorant of the parts of speech. They cannot tell you the difference between a verb and a noun. That might not sound particularly important until you realize that these students will graduate from college without the ability to write and communicate clearly in English. To put a finer point on this problem, when young adults complain about not being able to get a job after college, is it because nobody is hiring or because the candidate cannot write a coherent, error-free cover letter and resume? If I were hiring for a company and I had a stack of applications to go through, couldn't I make my life easier by immediately discarding every application with a spelling error in the first line? Classics teaches students attention to detail. It teaches students study skills that they might not have been exposed to in elementary or high school. It encourages independent learning of difficult subject matter. These skills are essential for success in the real world. They might be the difference between promotion and stagnation in a role, or getting your foot in the door, or not. Now, Add to this scenario a summer or two of doing archaeology in North Africa, and all of a sudden, the job interview is not a chore for the hiring partner, but a pleasure. These advantages are not entirely unique for the classic student, but they do exist in a particular combination that cannot be matched by a psychology degree, which, may I add, is just as, quote, useless as a classics degree is, if we define useless as the lack of a direct path to employment after graduation. Are there any other reasons to spend time with ancient language, culture, civilization, history, and art? Well, as it turns out, we need to defend the study of the ancient world because it's a matter of national security. This statement, while straightforward enough and easily defensible, 
for some reason or another, has proven to be enormously controversial. Despite the controversy, the fact remains that if the United States of America will continue to have a presence in international affairs and intends to defend its national interests overseas, it behooves all of us who live in this country to learn the history of the world in withering detail, and especially those countries in which we are engaged in military conflict. Perhaps another thought experiment is in order. What if the United States government decided that it was of vital national interest to engage in a military campaign in Iraq? What if, in the lead-up to this hypothetical war, it became abundantly clear that not a single person in the administration had any particular expertise in the 1,400-year-old history of Islam? What if the Sunni-Shia divide was not common knowledge in the halls of power? Does anyone even study the Muslim conquests of Byzantine territory under Muhammad or Abu Bakr? Or, what if the United States was engaged in a long-term adversarial relationship with Russia? How common should the study of the Kievan Rus and the Christianization of the Slavs actually be? In both scenarios, one cannot understand the current political, social, and cultural situation of the modern country in question without a fluent understanding of the history of the Roman Empire. But, Maybe you think American foreign policy is too interventionist. Maybe you would prefer to argue for a more isolationist stance on the world stage. Let's leave all the other countries of the world to their own devices, and let's focus on our own society and the myriad problems we face here. In that case, I suppose it's not compulsory to learn about other cultures and the history of other people on Earth. Maybe we shouldn't even learn about the history of the United States at all. Maybe we should just pretend that the country sprang onto the stage of history fully formed when we were born. Let's say for a moment that you agree, and that we pursue this policy. We eliminate all the history and classics and humanities from every college campus in the country. Now what? Does this action make us more or less likely to bumble our way into a war with another country if we don't understand either their history or our own? Furthermore, will people stop asking questions about history? If they don't, then who will answer them? Does it behoove us to have amateurs in a position to give misleading or ideologically motivated answers to curious people? Would anyone be so crass as to misrepresent history to support a narrow political goal? I can't imagine that anyone would do such a thing. It's no great mystery as to why the classics might attract its enemies. Traditionally, at least in Western Europe, the classics was a subject reserved for the elite of society. This was true in both a religious and secular sense, when at the time reading the Bible was the purview of the Catholic Church. Only a priest trained in Latin could interpret the word of God for his flock. The other members of aristocracy needed access to Latin, and eventually Greek, so that they could effectively communicate with their relatives living in other European countries, and or attend university. This pedigree breeds resentment from many quarters. For example, there still are devout Christians who don't necessarily want to study the earliest origins of Christianity. Such study could raise uncomfortable questions of faith in a student of the classics. Some of these questions include, has my personal religious or cultural institution actually strayed from the earliest intentions of its ancient predecessors? Or, does the fact that I can pinpoint the exact pagan roots of some of my deepest held religious beliefs somehow cheapen my religious experience? If a field of study can produce thoughts like this, why wouldn't we all be tempted to keep the classics at arm's length? The answer to these challenging questions lies not in intentional ignorance, at least I don't think so, but in brave and unflinching questioning of our collective social origin story. It lies in understanding that ancient people were real people who have left much of their cultural heritage to those of us living today. And, since they were real people, they were imperfect and sometimes abhorrent. It lies in understanding that modern cultural constructs 
regardless of how ancient their origins might be, are flexible and change with new scientific discoveries and greater access to other cultural and religious systems. Feeling bad about any of this, and therefore deciding that looking into it on a deeper level is self-defeating and will certainly lead to bad consequences. Let me put a finer point on this. We are going to train a generation of CIA agents, foreign diplomats, State Department officials, and experts in international relations, whether we close every classics and humanities department in the country or not. Do we, as a society, want these people to be ignorant of history and culture? Does it serve anyone's interest to have these people be ignorant about the cultures that we will inevitably entrust them to deal with in order to keep us safe? Perhaps this view is idealistic. Perhaps I will be accused of having some kind of sinister agenda for suggesting that we as a nation have a responsibility to better understand the history of the other people that we share the planet with. But I can assure you that none of this is born from political ideology, nor does it come from any desire to see another group of people suffer or be oppressed. Rather, I firmly believe that without a comprehensive understanding of the very origins, not only of Western culture, but Islamic culture, and Eastern European culture, and Central Asian culture, and Chinese culture, we are doomed to perpetual misunderstanding and constant conflict with foreign nations, which will lead to oppression of peoples across the world in our name. And furthermore, I'm not alone in this opinion. In 1961, John F. Kennedy founded the Peace Corps, the idea for this organization can be traced back to Walter Ruther, the president of the United Auto Workers Union in the 1950s. This quote of his sums up the idea nicely. I've been saying for a long time that I believe the more young Americans who are trained to join with other young people in the world, to be sent abroad with slide rule, textbook, and medical kid, to help people help themselves with the tools of peace, the fewer young people will need to be sent with guns and weapons of war. The idea is a simple one. We all do better if we support cross-cultural exchange. Of course, this idea has attracted its own set of critics. Richard Nixon was famously hostile to the idea of the Peace Corps, predicting that it would become a haven for draft dodgers and would foster a cult of escapism. But I think there's a sure way to know whether the Peace Corps was a good idea or not. That's because the Chinese government has essentially co-opted it for themselves, and now has implemented it on a much more massive scale. China, rather than send volunteers to foreign countries, has instead sent legions of students to foreign universities. To put this in perspective, according to China's Ministry of Education, in 2020, China sent 703,500 of their students overseas to study. 90% of those students returned to China when they were done studying. In comparison, the Peace Corps boasts 240,000 total participants since its inception in 1961. The benefits of China's strategy are many. By sending their students overseas, China has trained a core of people with foreign language and culture skills. These students will be the natural choice to oversee Chinese construction or infrastructure projects in foreign countries. Some of them will join the People's Liberation Army, or serve in the Chinese government. Those with foreign language experience can provide vital information on foreign countries that will certainly benefit Chinese foreign policy in the future. And if all of that wasn't enough, they have told their students to collect any research papers they might come across so that any innovations coming from the West, or elsewhere, might be intercepted and copied in China in real time. While we continue to ignore Chinese mythology, or the classical history of the Han Dynasty, the Chinese are learning the classics. At any rate, we classicists abdicate our responsibility to defend the field from its many detractors, not only to our own detriment, but to the detriment of society writ large. To continue to denigrate it as useless or a waste of time 
because it does not rise to the level of vocational training, a thing that only a very few STEM degrees can actually claim to do, is to condemn our country to a lesser existence on the world stage. It is to do no less than to accept a worse society for ourselves and future generations. To study the classics is to give ourselves every intellectual advantage in dealing with a complex world that only threatens more complexity. So, I ask you, dear listener, whether or not you personally want to meet that complexity unprepared. Does it serve any of our collective interests to do so? I'm Matt Lupu. Thanks for listening.